The walk through the wet sand was not fun for anyone. John kept getting hit the bottom of his boots caked with mud, making them so much heavier. So much so that he constantly had to flick them to try to get it off, but it was a losing battle. His only bonus in the walk was that he had limited clothing on due to it being so warm. With the sun shining down on, plus the evaporation of all the water kept him nice and cool, and it was just pleasant. Lao Chi didn't have much issue in the water. Being the lightest of the group, she didn't sink nearly as much. Also, she only carried a small pack due to having plenty of room in her cart now. That was due to not having the shelter or the cooker anymore, and with that, no one had to carry such a heavy load. Kib didn't care for the mud and found it much easier to travel on all fours. It kind of spread his weight out, he found out, so he didn't sink quite as much. He was the one to keep everyone's minds occupied as he spoke about an area on his planet just like this. Normally, he says, where adolescents go to cause a whole bunch of trouble, or old people go to soak themselves and let the minerals go into their scales. Bink, when not listening to Kib, did nothing but complain. You would think he would have an easier time of crossing, but he definitely did not. Mainly due to the fact that he does not have webbed feet. For his size, it's clear that he's designed to run on hard ground, as his feet are surprisingly narrow for someone his size. In addition, every single splash of mud was sticking to his feathers, making them heavier and heavier as we walked. If it wasn't for the fact that John had informed them that they would only have to cross the mud for a few hours, he would have definitely climbed into that suit even though the added weight would have made him sink even deeper in the mud, it would be worth than having to get all this garbage off of his feathers, he thought. The further they traveled from the ocean, the drier it continually got, eventually reaching an area that was nearly bone dry. John stopped everyone and told them to hold up until nightfall. Along with that, he ordered Lao Chi to get in the suit. She didn't want to, as it made her look like some sort of fat, marshmallow-covered deep-sea diver. John simply stated, I'm not asking. By now, they all knew that when John said that, uh, well, it was a matter of survival, and you don't argue with it. It took all three men to get the suit over her body. With almost no humidity in the air, her body had gone from slick to sticky having to hold certain parts of her body to get it in place so that they could get the suit in place, John was not beyond letting his hands wander just a bit. If Lao Chi noticed, she didn't say anything. Once she was fully inside the suit, John gave everyone a full briefing on what they would do. Once the suns began to set, they would start walking. John would take point and have a firm grip on his compass. They will walk until the first signs of dawn, then find some shade trees, preferably one or two clustered together. Once they have set up, no one, and he means no one, moves until the sun sets again. It will take about four nights to cross, but on the other side there should be a large freshwater river, which gave everyone hope. John stated, until we get across this desert, make sure you do not exceed your water ration. This is going to be the most difficult part of the journey, but a few minutes of relief can cost you your life out here. This will be why we will not travel during the day at all. Also, try not to eat too much as digestion requires more water. Kib jumped in, and he confirmed this as he comes from a very arid planet himself. Jumping on the bandwagon, he speaks for over an hour about those that got lost and turned into scavenger food. That night, they started walking. The cool night air was punctuated by the clear sky. 
John had kept minimal clothing on to radiate his heat. Behind him, Bink was happy that the mud had simply fallen from his feathers and had turned into sand and made this easy to walk. As they walked, the group could see the sweat on John's back. And then Bink noticed Lao Chi looking at him. He went up close and said, Enjoying the view? Lao Chi got a bit embarrassed from the implications, but didn't say anything. I'm surprised you have not mated with each other, especially as you spend your time examining each other the past few weeks. Lao Chi didn't say anything, but she tried to just slough it off. Do not try to deny it now. Kib jumped in. Leave her alone. This is a sensitive subject for all species. If you can't stop from being curious, it isn't like she and I would ever mate. Bink, on that, made a slight gesture of disgust as he got Lao Chi's attention. She turned to him. Am I so unappealing? She said this with complete concern in her eyes, wanting his actual honest reaction. Do not take it personal. It is simply a fact that your lack of plumage and lack of colorful beak. This is how we gauge our females' qualities to produce healthy offspring. Without these, my species wouldn't even care to give you a first glance. Lao Chi thought about that for a minute, then turned over to Kib. What about you, Kib? Do you think there is something unappealing about me as well? That comment made Bing suddenly feel like a total asshole for what he had said before, so he stayed out of it. Kib, for his part, thought for a moment before answered. Your proportions are okay, but I do not wish to offend. It will be fine. Continue. All right. My species puts a lot of emphasis on tails and care and maintenance of our horns and coloring, without being offensive, just stating fact. You have neither horns nor tail. Also, to my species, the gray-blue of your skin is one of, well, let's just say if it was one of my species, we would have taken you straight to the healer immediately, as that would be cause for alarm. As she pondered this very... Prometic answer, Bink spoke up. What are your thoughts about John? Have you not answered my query now, have you? Lao Chi moved her head to look at John's back and then looked away. He and I had this conversation already. His body is so bumpy now that he has so little energy reserves. There's also another factor. Both Bink and Kib were suddenly listening very intently. He's so... furry. Both men looked at the human in front, wearing shorts, boots, and not much else. They examined him, and didn't think the amount of fur was all that much. They thought back to the captain of the lovely angels, who had fur that covered his entire body. Rather thick fur at that. To the men, the human had barely any fur at all, yet they realized that to an aquatic species, it is actually an excessive amount. The conversations ended there for that night as everyone kind of climbed back into their own head and thought about what they had said. As the first glimmer came of dawn, John began looking around almost frantically. Suddenly turning, the group soon found themselves dropping their packs near a tree, a very large shade tree with a shrub next to it. They proceeded to have a very small meal. Then John put more clothing on before going to sleep on the tan hide. When they asked him why he put on layers when it was going to get hot, John simply reminded them about humans and thermal regulation. The rest of the group thought the same thing. Humans are weird. As the sun went down, they all started their trek again. 
This routine would repeat, with John keeping one eye firmly on the compass until he could see mountains in the distance. Pulling everyone together as soon as he saw it, he showed the group the direction in which the compass was pointed and a certain shadow. This gave the entire group a bit of a boost as far as motivation, and they now could see the other end of the desert. Sure enough, just after dawn on the second day after that, they reached the river. They didn't waste any time in diving towards it. Most of them dove straight into the river just to cool their bodies off, although Aochi really didn't need to. She just wanted out of that suit. Though, for the rest of the group, this was Shangri-La, what they were finally reaching. The trees and other foliage on the other side of the river would make a great place to shelter. The issue was coming from the not very wide, but particularly fast river. John was able to swim across, throw a lashing with a weight on it, and then yank the repulsor carts across along with the suit. Lauchi didn't need it and could easily cross herself. She just didn't have the needed arm strength or power needed to get the lashing across the water and, of course, pull the weights across. When Kib swam, he looked like an alligator weaving his way through the water. John didn't want to say it, but that made all the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Watching Bink cross was tantamount to a chicken trying to swim like a duck. In between laughing, John helped the others get them to shore. They would hold next to the river for a day or two while their bodies recovered from the walk across the desert. Even John was feeling spent after spending all that time in the hot, dry air. While they sit and recover under a newly made shelter, John pulls out the hollow map and shows them all exactly where they are. The group's morale instantly increased when they see how close they are to the colony. They're jubilant until they see John suddenly change expression. As he does, he doesn't say anything but he slowly reaches for the pulse rifle. Then he tells everybody to stay put. They all listen to him, and they wait, and they wait. They hear him walk away. Then they don't hear anything. Then they hear the shot. Hearing that, screw waiting, they all rushed out and quickly found John standing over the body of a strange reptile-like creature. This eight-legged creature looks like the crocodile crossed with a dragon without wings. Its eight legs are not segmented like a spider, but the main portion is shaped similar to a spider. As they look at it, John is standing over the creature, seemingly checking to make sure that he actually killed it. Then, he turned to the group and said, So, who's hungry? <laughs>